Clark. Government business order of the day, uh, consideration of the Prime Minister's annual report on closing the gap. Minister. I move that the Senate take note of the annual report of closing the gap and accompanying ministerial statements. Um, the question is that the Senate take note of the report. Oh, sorry, there will be debate. I, just keep talking. I don't have a speaker's <laughs> list. <laughs> Um, thank you very oh, much, Minister. Yeah, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Today I visited the other place to hear the Prime Minister's address and the Leader of the Opposition's address on closing the gap report 2020. It was a pleasure to hear the renewed bipartisan commitment to ensure progress over the next decade to close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. This is vital because, sadly, the results to date just aren't good enough. But I can assure the Senate and I can assure the Australian people that this government is committed to close the gap and we believe it is an initiative that can address the disparity between health, education, employment, life experience for Indigenous Australians. There can be no doubt that the seven target areas of child mortality, early childhood education, school attendance, literacy and numeracy, year 12 attainment, employment and life expectancy are crucial to making a difference in the lives of Indigenous people. While it is important to note that there has been progress on almost every measure of the existing framework, the fact of the matter is that we are only on target to meet two of the seven areas. Clearly, this is not where any of us want to be. The two targets that are on track are important because these support a bright future for the next generation. Our early childhood education, the target is to have 95 per cent of Indigenous four-year-olds enrolled in early childhood education by 2025 because childhood education is important to a child's cognitive and social development, that target is on track. In 2018, 86.4 per cent of children were enrolled in early childhood education compared um, with 91.3 per cent of non-Indigenous children. On year 12 attainment or equivalent, the target is to halve the gap for Indigenous Australians aged between 20 and 24 in year 12 or equivalent by 2020, and employment is crucial to finding work. That target is also on track. In 2018 and 19, around 66 per cent of Indigenous Australians aged between 20 and 24 years of age had attained year 12 or the equivalent. In the past decade, that has increased by 21 percentage points. But the targets in the five areas that did not meet are equally important. On child mortality, the target is to halve the gap for Indigenous, children's under five, Indigenous children under five within a decade. Although there has been progress in maternal and child health, improvements in mortality rates have not been seen, seen enough to meet the 2018 target. In the 10-year period 2008 to 2018, Indigenous child mortality rates improved by 7 per cent. We absolutely must make more progress on this. On school attendance, the target is to close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous school attendance within five years. At 2018, this target was not met. Attendance rates for Indigenous students remain lower than for non-Indigenous students, with around 82 per cent of Indigenous students in comparison to 92 per cent in 2019. Gaps in attendance are evident from the first year of schooling and widens during secondary schooling. On literacy and numeracy, the target is to halve the gap for Indigenous children in reading, writing, numeracy within a decade. While the gap narrowed across all year levels between 3 and 11 percentage points, it has not been enough to meet the targets. On employment, the target is to halve the gap in employment outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians within a decade. We did not meet this target by 2018. In 2018, the Indigenous employment rate was 49 per cent compared to 75 per cent for non-Indigenous Australians. This is disappointing that over the past there has been little change on this measure. The target for life expectancy has a target of closing the life expectancy gap within a generation by the year 2031. At this time, this target is not on track. Over the period 2006 to 2018, there was an improvement of almost 10 percentage points in Indigenous mortality rates. However, non-Indigenous mortality rates improved at a similar rate, meaning this gap has not narrowed. To make sure we see real change over the coming decade, we need a collegiate collective commitment to improve and improvement to change this for future Indigenous Australians. <laughs> 
And that is exactly what the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ken White, is changing in his approach to closing the BAP 2020. Up until now, that approach has been very much a top-down approach. So despite the very best intentions and all the resources that have been applied to this task, if we have failed to deliver our goals, we have missed the mark. A new closing the gap process that is truthful, strengths-based and community-led and which puts an Aboriginal and a Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islander people at its very, very core is absolutely essential. Unless all Australians see the gap, we need to close from the point of view of Indigenous Australians. We will not see, succeed in our mission. That is why this new era does not uh, include targets set by governments. <laughs> Minister Wyatt, working with Indigenous leadership that makes up the coalition of peaks, and the state and territory governments will determine the right design for the next framework. This new approach is locally led, collaborative and will make much further progress than the one-size-fits-all government-led approach could ever have hoped to achieve. The process is to refresh, close the gap strategy. It's taken time, but when the framework is right, we will do better. The reform priorities already identify include developing and strengthening structures to ensure full involvement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and embedding ownership and responsibility and ex expertise to close this gap. It also includes building the formal Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled services sector to deliver closing the gap services and programs in agreed priority areas. It also includes ensuring all mainstream government agencies and institutions undertake systemic and structural transformation to contribute to closing the gap. In conclusion, our future approach to closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians must be different from the past. We must do it differently and we must do it together. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I acknowledge we meet on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and can I pay my respects to and recognise my First Nations colleagues? Uh, first, the extraordinary Australian sitting behind me, Senator Patrick Dodson, uh, Senator Mullandiri McCarthy, and of course the member for Barton, uh, Ms. Linda Burney, uh, Ms. Burney, and the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Ken Wyatt. I do want to say something about what. The gift that Senators Dodson and McCarthy and Ms Burney have given the Australian Labor Party. Our First Nations caucus has been such a transformative experience, I think, for people in our caucus uh, and uh, has meant for so many of us that the reality of the experience of our First Nations people has been given so much greater uh, weight but also experience in our caucus. And it's been profoundly moving, I think, for many of us, uh, and we are grateful for it. I also recognise the many First Nations people who have come to Parliament on this day and were there to see <coughs> Mr Morrison and Mr Albanese uh, give their speeches. Of course, with the tabling of the Closing the Gap report, we should be talking about progress. But we're not really. We're talking about inertia. We're talking about our failure to meet many targets. We know that uh, there, have been some, there have been some successes, but they are insufficient. We know that the health of our Indigenous Australians is far worse than non-Indigenous Australians. We know that the Indigenous child mortality rate is still twice that of non-Indigenous children. We know that Indigenous Australians live around eight years less than others, and the gap is, other Australians, and the gap is even wider in remote and regional areas. We know that our children, our First Nations children, are being left behind and locked out of opportunity. One in four but performing below minimum standards for reading, one in five below minimum standards for numeracy. Incarceration rates of First Nations people are unacceptable. Two per cent of the population, 27 per cent of the prison population. And we have seen, particularly in recent times, the prevalence of suicides, particularly amongst young people, ripping families and communities apart. 
There have been some who suggested that the problem was that the ambition was too great in these gaps, in the, in, in the gap targets. Well, the parliament should ask itself whether we would tolerate these facts, the gap, for any other part of our society. We cannot compound over 200 years of dispossession with an acceptance of disadvantage. As Mr Albanese said, we can't keep coming back here year in, year out, wringing our hands. And the new way forward has to be led by First Nations people in meaningful and mutually agreed partnerships. The Coalition of Peaks has said clearly what government needs to do to improve services to First Nations people. And the three form reform priorities are formal partnerships between government and First Nations people on closing the gap, growing community controlled services and improving mainstream delivery service. But change does begin with listening. That's easy to say, isn't it? Much harder to do, but I'll return to that point. You see, if we really want to see progress on closing the gap, we must probably, properly understand how the consequences of dispossession, the removal from country and culture, misguided policies that have transcended generations can still be seen and felt today. I will never forget Senator Dodson's first speech. It was a privilege to hear it, but it was pretty hard to hear about hiding in the grass and a reminder of what has happened and still reverberates today. You see, I don't believe we can understand the challenges of today if we do not understand that the causes so often remain rooted in the past. We must stop repeating the mistakes of the past and we must actually genuinely listen to First Nations Australians. So we welcome the partnership between the Coalition of Peaks and Governments. <coughs> Government and the Labor looks forward to supporting new and ambitious targets and structural changes to close the gap, including the important areas of child removal and incarceration, and the resources to enable that. A direct and secure voice to decision makers will build on the work of peaks and ensure that the issues and perspectives of our First Nations people are not left to languish on the fringes. And a genuine commitment means that local and regional services and programs will be adequately resourced and properly funded. I have to say it is difficult to accept a commitment as genuine when half a billion dollars was cut from the Indigenous Affairs budget by this government. We are all challenged to do better with more diligence and commitment. We all wish to determine our own lives. It's part of the way in which we understand agency and meaning and identity. Other Australians aren't just asked to be practical. And our Indigenous leaders have been telling politicians for years that self-determination matters. Well, maybe it is time we did listen. Maybe we don't know best. Today in the parliament, Mr Morrison said that the government wants a partnership where we listen, work together and decide together. We have this clarion call from our First Nations people, the Uluru Statement. A statement, as Anthony Albanese said, of unadorned power. I would, say, I would add, of clarity voice, truth-telling, agreement-making. The voice, a modest request, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples be consulted about policies and issues that directly affect them. Not, as some have mischievously said, a third chamber or deliberative chamber. Of course, another element in the statement, the call from First Nations people is truth. We do need to tell the truth. I remember, and I'm sure Senators Dodson and McCarthy remember much more so, the way John, Mr Howard most infamously discouraged Australians from engaging with the truth. Do you remember a black armband view of history? Well, I'm pleased that we seem to have moved on, on that, from this because 
not acknowledging the truth not only does not permit us to work together to close the gap, it deepens the wounds. We must tell the truth and all of us should be our best selves. We must seek acceptance and reconciliation. As Richard Flanagan said, what black Australia offers to the nation is not guilt about our history, but an invitation to our future. Then, of course, there is Makarata. Senator McCarthy explained it to me after the statement came out. I, I probably understand a bit. But I'm reminded of so many examples internationally where reconciliation and progress required people making peace with themselves and each other. Mr Albanese described it today as conflict revolution, resolution, making peace after a dispute, justice and of course the path to a national treaty. Hear, hear. What I would say to the coalition, so I felt a great sadness today when the Prime Minister talked about we must listen, but then went on to make clear that the coalition were going to ignore uh, what was sought or put aside um, or not, press forward on what was sought in the Uluru Statement. You can't ask people to tell you what they want and then turn away when they do. You can't ask people for, to consult with you, then make it clear in the national parliament that you actually don't like the answer. That's not respect. That's not consultation. That's not listening. I finish on this point. Our first Australians have been deeply connected with country on this continent for over 60,000 years. The UN people in the southeast, the Yawuru people in the northwest, the Ongnu people of, of Irkala in the north, the Muinina people in the south, the Noongar people of the southwest, the Mir in the Torres Strait, the Ghana in South Australia, and the Pichitinjara people of the Central Desert and more. It is sometimes forgotten in the cut of thrust of this place. The profound honour we have in having First Nations people across our entire continent, the oldest continuous civilisation on earth, people whom we have the privilege of representing. There's too often a tone of burden where there should be a feeling of pride. This parliament should ask itself whether it takes the pride we should in our first Australians. And as much in, as, as in the results of any report, we may find the gap we need to close is actually within us. Senator Dodson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. Well, here we are again. Another parliamentary new year, another recital of policy failure, another appeal to cop it sweet and be patient. For more than a decade now, there's been this grand, ho this grand hog ritual where my members from this chamber uh, troop over to the other place, there to be told uh, that most of the targets to closing the gap and disadvantage between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples continue to be beyond our reach. No one is ever held accountable for this. First Nations peoples are expected to be impressed that Parliament is talking about them and taking the time to do so. Today we learnt that only two of the seven Closing the Gap targets are on track. Early childhood education, and Year 12 attainment. So let me remind you of the five targets that are not on track. Tragically, the target to halve the mortality rates of First Nations children is not on track. Just as tragically, the target to close the gap in life expectancy by 2031 is not on track. The target to close the gap in school attendance by 2018 is not on track. The target to halve the gap in reading and numeracy by 2018 is not on track. 
and the target to halve the gap in employment by 2018 is also uh, not on track. <clears throat> but as grim as the picture is, it fails to reveal the whole sorry story of inequality, focused as the targets have been on health, education and employment. The targets tell us nothing about the over-representation of First Nations men, women and young people in the crowded prisons across this land. It tells us nothing about the exploitation of others who work for the dole under the persistently titled or the perversely titled Community Development Program, or those whose income is not theirs to manage under the rules of the cashless debit card. And to tell us nothing about the abject circumstances which beset those thousands and thousands of First Nations peoples who live in remote communities where access to basic services is a constant struggle. It's worth remembering today that the Closing the Gap regime grew out of the work of the Australian Human Rights Commission and in particular the National Inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families. The inquiry was established by the Keating government back in 1995. The Bringing Them Home report, primarily the work of the late Sir Ronald Wilson and my brother Mick Dodson, the Social Justice Commission, was tabled in Parliament in May 1997. Their report identified gross uh, violations of Aboriginal people's human rights and spoke about the removal of children as genocide as genocide and aimed at wiping out Indigenous families, communities and cultures. Prime Minister Howard was much discomforted by the report and could not bring himself to accept the recommendation that this Parliament of Australia apologise for those dreadful uh, points of history. Undermining that stubbornness and intransigence was an ill-founded fear of the Crown's liability was going to be an astronomical compensation claim. And so an apology remi remained a moot point for more than a decade, till a new Prime Minister, Labor's Kevin Rudd, formally apologised to the stolen generations. On that momentous day, on the 13th of February 2008, whilst he did not offer compensation, he went further than an apology. He laid out a framework of, ten years, uh, of a 10-year program to close the gap. Our challenge for the future is to embrace a new partnership between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, Prime Minister Rudd told the Parliament 12 years ago. The core of this partnership for the future, he said, is closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians on life expectancy, educational achievements and employment opportunities. It was a well-intentioned agenda of practical reconciliation, but the outcomes have been so dismal. What an indictment. What a blight on this nation. Twelve years with such little to show for it. No wonder that those First Nations peoples who gathered at Uluru in May 2017 lamented and proclaimed the torment of our powerlessness. Now we have the torment of this government's sluggishness as it crawls to develop a new 10-year framework for closing the gap. The process is called the Closing the Gap Refresh. It began in the federal bureaucracy two years ago and there's no outcome yet. Much money has been spent on travel and talk fests. Expensive consultants have come and gone and still we have no new framework. The Prime Minister tells us in the forward of this year's Closing the Gap report this is not a process we should rush. Well, I say that's not good enough. The Commonwealth Administration of Indigenous Affairs, after the disastrous machinery of government changes by the Abbott government in 2013, falls under the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. So the buck stops with the Prime Minister. And all the Prime Minister can say to justify this protracted protracted process of drawing up a new framework 
is that getting it right is worth the time it takes. I'm not fussed about getting it right, but what worries me is the lack of urgency. At least the government has belatedly engaged First Nations peak organisations in the process to develop a new national agreement on closing the gap. A new agreement is to be underpinned by the four principles, developing formal partnerships between governments and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, giving Aboriginal uh, community control services greater roles, improving mainstream service delivery and developing a development of local data processes to enable people to make better decisions. Those are all worthy principles, but as no new program, as we know, no new program uh, will succeed. It will fail unless it has adequate resources and unless bureaucracies earnestly embrace those principles and it does have the First Nations wholehearted participation. And in the end, any new agenda, a new agenda will amount only to practical reconciliation. My commitment has always been to real con reconciliation and the commitment of my leader, Anthony Albanese, in the other place this morning, he said that this country is not reconciled and a country that is not reconciled is not truly whole. Until we are whole, our true potential as a nation will continue to elude us, he said. When they met at Uluru nearly three years ago now, First Nations peoples laid out a clearly preferred pathway to reconciliation and wholeness. Labor supports in full the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The first call of that statement was for a voice to the parliament to be enshrined in the constitution. The oppos opposition leader this morning described this as a great and unifying mission. But this government does not have the will to embrace that because hard heads in the hard right don't have the heart for true reconciliation. Rather, this government wants a voice to the government, a voice that is not protected by being enshrined in the constitution. The Prime Minister said this morning that his government supports recommendations about truth-telling in the 2018 report of the Joint Select Committee into Constitutional Recognition, and that's a good thing. But he could not bring himself to mention the union word makarata, which the Uluru Statement from the Heart called for. Makarata, as the opposition leader said this morning, let everyone feel those four syllables. Conflict resolution. It doesn't this nation need conflict resolution with its first people. Making peace after a dispute, and hasn't this dispute gone on for far too long? And justice, so that we can all be liberated and become better people. And yet, a, and this to be achieved through a pathway to a national treaty. There's certainly, there was no, uh, there was certainly no mention of national treaty by the Prime Minister this morning. We are left to surmise only that Makarata and treaty are steps too far for this government. What does that say about the leadership? We as a nation are capable of great achievements, especially at times of crisis, like the drought, like the fire and the floods and the coronavirus. We're very capable of responding to great things. It's time we respond to the First Nations requirements. Why then, it just befuddles me, why this intransigence to something that's blatantly clear, that's simple and is not, being, not asking for much, is constantly eluding us. Finally, today let me acknowledge and pay tribute to those who show untiring leadership on the front lines where the gaps are widening and are stark. Those who bear a heavy burden and toil day and night to care for children at risk and to worry for their loved ones. Those unsung heroes who soldier on, sometimes at great personal risk, and are unsupported because of the lack of adequate resources.
There goes real leadership, and I salute them all. Order. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, uh, Acting Presi Deputy President. As leader of the Nationals in the Senate, I would like to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngambri and Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Since 2008, Australian governments have worked to deliver better life expectancy, mortality rates, education, employment outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But today's report highlights uh, the issues that we've had in uh, closing that gap. We haven't achieved what was expected and we haven't collectively achieved what was needed. Today's update shows Australia is on track to un meet only two of the seven set targets, specifically having 95 per cent of all Indigenous four-year-olds enrolled in early childhood education by 2025 and halving the gap for Indigenous Australians aged 20 to 24 in year 12 attainment or equivalent attainment rates by 2020. We note that there have been improved outlooks in some areas, such as education, yet progress in many other areas still lags behind our community's expectations. The target to halve the gap in child mortality rates by 2018 wasn't met. The target to halve the gap for Indigenous children in reading, writing and numeracy within a decade was not met. And the target to close the gap in life expectancy by 2031 is also not on track. Only by acknowledging our failures can we move forward make better informed decisions and make a positive future for all Australians. We must not be afraid to learn from each other. And 2020 marks the next stage of our Closing the Gap refresh to deliver shared responsibility and accountability, uh, led by our nation's first Indigenous Minister for Indigenous Affairs, uh, Minister Wyatt. I just wanted to speak specifically uh, tonight on a key indicator that uh, we feel quite strongly about, and that's employment for our Indigenous Australians. No state or territory met the target to halve the gap in employment outcome within a decade. Employment rates for Indigenous Australians increased, but only in New South Wales and the Northern Territory. Job security, meaningful full-time work, provides financial and economic security and helps to open the door to self-determination. Employment status uh, also has associations, as we all know, with the outcomes for health, social and emotional well-being and living standards. The Nationals welcome the new approach to closing the gap, local people leading local solutions. As a former teacher, it was great to note that since 2014 we have seen significant investments in Indigenous youth and education initiatives, opening the door to real secure jobs across rural and regional Australia. 45,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth are being supported on their education journey through a raft of mentoring, scholarships and leadership programs. But there is so much more to do. Education is the door to better job outcomes. And in the past 10 years, the number of Indigenous Australians accessing higher education has more than doubled, and currently almost 20,000 Indigenous Australians are attending university. Young, employed Indigenous Australians with Year 12 qualifications are more likely and early school leavers to be full employed full-time and be in a skilled occupation. These outcomes need to be celebrated and used to build momentum for greater improvements, from education to health to employment opportunities. The evidence clearly shows education is the door to better job outcomes. And when it comes to employment, gaps exist, a gaping chasm. In 2018, Indigenous employment rates were 49 per cent compared to 75 per cent for non-Indigenous Australians. The target to halve that gap uh, has not been met, and until recently closing the gap was not a real partnership with Indigenous people. The Community Development Program, although, has supported remote job seekers into almost 30,000 jobs. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities have greater control now over the program, with a focus on flexible, locally-led support for job seekers. We're listening to people in remote communities because they are our communities. The Nationals focus is on doing what these communities want and need, not what special interest groups want. Economic empowerment is key and realised and hoped for in Collinsville, North Queensland, where traditional owners are leading a coal-fired power station project proposal with a focus on Indigenous employment. Australia's first high-efficient, low-emission, ultra-supercritical coal-fired power plant uh, could mean 
2,000 jobs in regional Queensland during the construction phase and 600 regional jobs once operations begin, as I said, with a focus on Indigenous employment. Including Indigenous Australians in making local decisions to build capacity uh, employment in all ben benefits all economic and obviously with those social benefits. Sustainable, ongoing, meaningful employment in regional communities for everyone uh, is a priority for the National Party. Putting Indigenous Australians in the decision-making process, as outlined by the Prime Minister, will mean better outcome for all. This next chapter of Closing the Gap will be guided by the principles of empowerment and self-determination and deliver a community-led strategy that enables Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to move beyond uh, the present into thriving uh, future. Rewarding careers is what we want to see. Indigenous Australians at local, regional and national level are embedding knowledge and leadership. They're co-designing the systems, policies and operational frameworks and are working with governments to make positive change for their families and communities. They're our communities. We're sharing priorities with Indigenous Australians and with state and territory governments. And for the first time, Indigenous expertise is at the table with government, not to be told what will happen, but the opposite. For the first time, Indigenous expertise uh, will be used to talk, to educate, to inform, uh, so that they can have a real and meaningful input uh, into a say around future developments. We are seeing more Indigenous kids in school by working with the community. Uh, and initiatives such as the Teacher Boost for Remote Australia, removing all or part of the help debt for over 3,000 students, will encourage more teachers to work and stay in very remote areas, as uh, Senator Dodson raised. It, basic services being delivered to remote and regional communities means we have to get more teachers, more nurses, more doctors practising in these communities uh, so that Indigenous Australians living there can uh, have the full experience of being a citizen of this country and the services that that should entitle them to. By discussing and recognising the past and understanding the present, we will better equip, we're better equipped to create positive change, to eliminate the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. For this 100 years, the National Party has worked to ensure rural and regional Australians have the same opportunities as those in the city. This is our challenge. We know a good education leads to a rewarding long-term career. We want to see partnerships, not paternalism. Only together can we hope to close the gap so that all Australians enjoy all the benefits of this country that is both young and infinitely ancient. Thank you. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Acting Dep Deputy President. I rise also to speak on the Closing the Gap report for 2020. Firstly, I acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of uh, the land that we are meeting on. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this land was never ceded and that we have, as a nation, a lot of unfinished business. I'd first like to start talking about progress on closing the gaps and making some comments as they relate to what sort of things we do need to do if we are going to um, meet the aspirations that were included in these particular set of targets and those that are currently being developed with the coalition of PAKES. The target to ensure 95 per cent of all First Nations four-year-olds are enrolled in early uh, childhood education by 2025 is on track, although I will notice that it looks like um, that has, uh, enrolments have decreased um, over the last 12 months, and I'm deeply concerned that some of the changes that have been made to uh, the way that childcare subsidies are in fact in disproportionately impacting on First Nations parents. Um, and I've had some pretty strong feedback from uh, on that particular issue and the complications that are now uh, much harder for uh, parents to navigate or First Nations parents to navigate in the bush particularly. In 2018, 86.4% of First Nations children were enrolled in early childhood education. This is a very important step um, to um, ensuring and, and ensuring that people, um, young people stay connected uh, with school and, of course, developing um, a child's cognitive and social um, skills. I will note here, and I'll come back to the um, child commissioner's report that I in fact commented early on in this place, earlier this week in this place, where she notes, for example, that ear health, 
um, for First Nations children is 2.9 times uh, worse um, than non-Indigenous children, and they're more 2.9 times more likely to have a hearing problem. Uh, this is uh, an issue that I have been passionate about over the years, and it is deeply connected to education. Because if we don't address that issue and get on top of it, um, the children's engagement with school is deeply affected uh, by um, hearing impairments. Another one of that's one of the targets. The other, should I say, target that is. Uh, um, on track to be met is um, having the gap in year 12 attainment or equivalent for First Nations students. Around 66 per cent of First Nations 20 to 24 year olds had attained year 12 or equivalent, which is a, an important improvement. Yet it is with a very heavy heart that I note that the rest of the targets were not on track to meet. The target to have the gap in mortality rates for First Nations children under five within a decade is not even close to being met. In fact, being, um, because, in fact because non Indigenous infant mortality rates have improved at a faster rate, the gap has actually widened. First Nations child mortality rate was twice the rate of non Indigenous children. Um, ten children, Aboriginal children, are ten times. Um, more likely than non-Indigenous children um, to end up in out of home or being taken into the child care, um, the child protection system. Forty percent of those in the out of home care system are Aboriginal children, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. In fact, we have more children, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, in out of home care now than we did when the bringing the bringing them home report was tabled. These statistics are not what you would expect and do not belong in a so-called First Nation country like Australia. We are also far away from closing the gap in life expectancy by 2031. First Nations women have a life expectancy gap of 7.8 years and First Nations men have a gap of 8.6 uh, years. These targets are heavily dependent on the social determinants of health and well-being, and these issues include housing, education, income support, wages, employment. We are failing to address these particular issues, particularly for First Nations peoples. So how can we expect that we would be closing the gap if these social determinants of health are not being dealt with? It is estimated that social determinants are responsible for at least 34 per cent of the health gap between First Nations peoples and non-Indigenous peoples. This is one of the reasons why we, are not, we have not made progress in closing the gap. The target to close the gap in school attendance is also not on track. School attendance rates for years 1 to 10 have not improved for First Nations students over the past five years. Similarly, the target to halve the gap in the share of First Nations children at or above national minimum standards in reading and numeracy within the decade has not been met. About one in four First Nations students in years five, seven and nine remain below national minimum standards in reading. Finally, we are also not going to meet the target to halve the gap in employment outcomes for First Nations and non the gap. Um, between First Nations and non-Indigenous um, people within a decade. In 2018, the employment rate for First Nations peoples was around 49 per cent compared to 75 per cent for non-Indigenous Australians. This data shows, as Pat Turner, the chair or the co-chair um, of the current COAG process and chair of the Coalition of Peaks, so, she so clearly articulated this week there is, no, there is more than just a gap. It is a chasm, a gaping wound on the soul of our nation. Now, I want to come to the inability of consecutive, of, of, of consecutive governments to um, meet the closing the gap targets. And it's not through lack of ambition from First Nations peoples or the commitment from First Nations peoples to take the message to government and to try, try and work with government to meet these uh, targets. But you have to look at some of those is the issues that are stopping us meeting those targets. 
I've just been through the failure to adequately address issues around social determinants of health, such as housing. When you are living in an overcrowded house, how can you be expected to go to school ready? And we've, and we've canvassed this issue so much in this place, but we are still seeing a failure to invest in housing in employment outcomes. But when you have discriminatory policies, such as the Northern Territory intervention, which is still being applied in the Northern Territory under another name, by and large, but those policies are still there, and we have a government that is intent on forcing the current uh, income manage, compulsory income management process into the cashless debit card, which takes me to overall a cashless debit card. A top-down, Prime Minister, if you're listening to this debate in the chamber, a top-down approach, uh, the very approach you had to go at in your contribution on your statement today on closing the gap. He made a specific reference to top-down approaches, and yet that is what the cashless debit card is. That is what the community development program is. It's no wonder we're not meeting and closing the gap on employment, because that is a failed program. That program ends up penalising First Nations peoples. Wildly, disproportionately increase in the number of penalties applied in regional and remote communities through the CDP program, which means people lose money, they end up even further entrenched in poverty. These sorts of punitive approaches have to stop if we have any hope in closing the gap. Today, Scott Morrison acknowledged in his address that top-down approach hasn't worked for First Nations peoples. So why is the government not scrapping the policies that they seek to Im or they are imposing through this top-down approach, which is not working, and the evidence shows that. The evaluation of Northern Territory intervention showed it met none of its objectives. This card, this card disproportionately impacts on First Nations peoples and entrenches poverty, disadvantage and stigma. People talk about, still talk about it being like ration days. A recent study found, and this came out at the inquiry into the next rollout of the card, a recent study found that women on compulsory income management in the Northern Territory under the Northern Territory intervention were more likely to have babies with low birth weights. That's critical evidence, critical evidence there. Peer-reviewed, thorough research. The government's imposition of compulsory income management contradicts its commitment to the new national agreement on closing the gap. We have far too many First Nations peoples caught up in the criminal justice system. And we've heard the statistics for both young people, women and men. And yet we still haven't seen the government, Northern Territory government or the government here fully committing to the implementation of the Royal Commission into Youth Justice in the Northern Territory. Absolutely critical recommendations around diversionary programs, about stopping and making sure that young people don't end up in the justice system in the first place. These are the sorts of evidence-based policies that will meaningfully break the cycle of involvement with the criminal justice system. And there's been consistent pushback over the years to include justice targets in the existing Closing the Gap targets, something that the government, when they're in opposition, committed to and then didn't do when they got, in, got into government. It's appalling that we still see the lack of implementation of the reports that, in fact, Senator Dodgson um, referred to, the Royal Commission's, um, the Bringing Them Home reports and the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. We've only just seen the implementation of a custody, custody notification system in Western Australia. I'm really pleased that it's there now, but it's only just happened. Those recommendations were from 1991. Today, the Prime Minister used the word job seven times in his address, as if that is some sort of magic anecdote to closing the gap. Yes, it is very important. I'm not saying it's not. But A, we have failed approaches, but unless you address those social determinants to health, it's very difficult to ensure that people can actually, First Nations people can actually get meaningful uh, jobs and be able to um, stay in those jobs. The CDP program is failing 
It's discriminatory. It's failing. It needs to be replaced. And it's not for want of Aboriginal organisations presenting to government very, very good programs that can be implemented. They have a plan for how you could imp increase employment. But again, not taken up. No, they'll tinker around with the, with the community development program. So we have a long way to go. If we are genuinely going to close the gap under this new process, it means that the government is going to have to get rid of those discriminatory programs. I do want to turn now to the future and the positive work that's being done on closing the gap with the Coalition of Peaks, a group of 50 community-controlled peak organisations who are now working in co-design with, with COAG on a new national agreement on closing the gap. This new agreement will set shared priorities and targets for the next decade. For the first time, Aboriginal peoples have an equal voice and full, hopefully full ownership of the Closing the Gap framework. This historic partnership gives First Nations peoples shared decision-making power with governments. And Pat Turner today um, at, the, uh, for, at the lunch, at the Closing the Gap lunch, um, really clearly articulated that it has to be at national, state, local level. Very clear about that. She articulated those the, prior, the key priorities they have put to government about agreement over decision-making processes and being at the table at all those level of governments. That services have to be led, delivered and developed by community-controlled organisations. But that mainstream organisations also have to take responsibility and carry out their, deliver their services um, with uh, two First Nations peoples and not in a discriminatory manner. She also made the very strong point about ownership of the data, making sure they get access to data. Those are, uh, are the priorities they have put um, to government. It's not there yet. We have to see the outcome of that continuing work. There's a lot of people putting a lot of faith in that process. It's a particularly important um, process that can change the direction of literally change the direction of this nation it can ensure that aboriginal people do and are self-determining that they are leading and developing and owning the programs that they know will work that they won't be subject to the vagaries of changing government priorities all the time senator seward your time has expired senator mccarthy Acting Deputy President. Keep going. There's no speaking list. There's, sorry, Senator Hanson. Um, I've, there's no speaking list, and I've called Senator, Senator McCarthy, and I'll call you next. And I'll call you next. There is no Senator Hanson. There is no speaking list. I've called Senator McCarthy, and I will call you next. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It depends on who you speak to today as to what today means to different people. If you talk to uh, you know young Australians, in particular, I had a, an interview with uh, Triple J Hack not long ago. Uh, they have a different view of what this day means in terms of uh, the parliament's efforts to improve the lives for First Nations people. And they ask you pretty heavy questions, and I thought that was important that those questions were asked uh, about where we've come. And the fact that in the parliament today uh, there was an acceptance of a failure in achieving the targets uh, that we've all stood uh, each year since 2008, whether in the parliament or in our respective places outside the parliament in whatever organisations we work as First Nations people, of wanting to believe that the Parliament of Australia is sincere and genuine in a determined focus to improve the lives for First Nations people, but also to improve the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. So that's the young people of this country who look at the parliament today and ask, why have you failed? What are you guys doing? What are you, the coalition, doing? What are we, Labor, doing? 
What are the crossbenchers doing? What are the First Nations members of the parliament doing to improve the lives of First Nations people? And it was a, it was a, a poignant question because it's a question that goes to the heart, I believe, and should go to the heart of each and every member of the Senate and the House of Representatives. But when I came into the parliament this morning and read articles of the treatment of the First Nations minister, Ken White, uh, by his own colleagues on his side, and when I read about uh, the views of my fellow senators uh, on the uh, government benches in terms of their views on the future of First Nations people in a constitution to be recognised, uh, to have a voice, I got angry, really angry. Because this day is about, and it's the one day of the year that our parliament should be focusing completely on First Nations people. Here, here. And yet again, we're distracted by internal conflict in the parties opposite, in the leaders who could be doing more. And so when you have the young Australians asking these questions, each and every one of us don't really have an answer adequate enough to justify why we're failing in these targets. But when you also speak to young Australians who ask these questions, you try to connect the history of how this began in 2008, when Prime Minister Kevin Rudd had to work with a hostile parliament to just say sorry to the stolen generations of this country, a hostile parliament where members walked out, refused to acknowledge that this was a significant day with the apology to First Nations people. Yet out on the lawns, out front of Parliament House and right across the country, hundreds and thousands of Australians gathered, black and white. Why? Because they wanted to have hope. Hope in a future that was theirs. Hope in a future that belonged to their children and grandchildren for all people who call Australia home. So when we come together for Close the Gap Day, that is what First Nations people are looking for, that continued hope for that vision for a future, an everyday living. But we fail as members of parliament when we cannot connect, cannot listen to what First Nations people are saying. When we talk about CDP, the Community Development Program, when we talk about the cashless debit card, when we know from numerous inquiries the entrenched poverty that continues across the regions of Australia. These have a direct correlation to the health, the education, the housing and the jobs and, most importantly, the life expectancy of our First Nations people. So when young Australians ask what we're doing, I can say, well, I work on inquiries. I worked with Senator Keneally on the stillbirth inquiry. And we went around the country and listened to those families. And we know that with the rate of stillbirth for Indigenous people is far greater, just like most of the other health factors that we talk about in here. And to the credit of Greg Hunt, the health minister, he listened to those recommendations and he made a difference by following through. Now that's a really good example that we can stand up on Close the Gap Day and we can talk about what we have done together as parliamentarians from all walks of life. But when I listened to the Prime Minister today speak, wanting again to find that hope and that way forward, I looked at the minister sitting beside him, Ken White, 
And I thought, you know, I want to believe that when you say, Prime Minister, that you're engaging with First Nations people, I want to believe that that's just not lip service. That when people, leaders like Pat Turner and other leaders of the Aboriginal community controlled organisations in this country sit beside you, whether it's at the cabinet table, whether it's in a room in the parliament, whether it's out there beyond the parliament, when you say you're engaging, <coughs> then that has to follow through with the policies that you deliver in this parliament. Because I can tell you, those First Nations people who are sitting with you today are going to be the same people who will turn around tomorrow and really give it to you if you are not genuine in that engagement. You may say you have them at the table now, but if you do not treat them with the respect that must come through both this Senate and in that House in terms of the policies that this parliament delivers to improve the lives of First Nations people, you will not be calling that an engagement anymore. You will need the Makarata Commission after that. Let me tell you. And then when I see Ken White sitting there, someone who I have no doubt has the greatest sincerity in wanting to improve the lives for people in this country and improve the understanding between black and white people, I find it really shallow when the people sitting around him are forever in the newspapers at some stage or other wanting to tear him down, wanting to rubbish him as a minister, wanting to say that he's no good and put him in his place, and then say, we don't know anything about a constitution, no one's talked to us about a referendum. Well, hello, senators. We've been talking about it since May 2017. But it isn't about the constitution, isn't it? Is it? It's actually about your relationship with a First Nations man in your cabinet. And I can say, as an Aboriginal woman, and forget what side of politics I may be on, it's disgraceful the way that you treat him. And if you think holding him out on this day is going to cover the bases for you, let me tell you that First Nations people will see right through that as I am speaking to you right now as I see it. So there has to be a genuine connection, and I say this to young Australians because they ask these questions of me and I'm sure they will ask it of many others. To those listeners who join in on Triple J and all the young shows around the country, they deserve to know whether there is hope for the future. Are we as a parliament courageous enough to have that sincere engagement, to open our eyes and our hearts to the fact that when you crush people so much it means you are keeping them down with those policies that I know Senator Dodson and my colleagues talk about, I know the Greens talk about. We know that they do have a direct correlation to whether they're rising above the entrenched poverty that we see right across the country. I mean, let's talk about jobs. When the ministers get up in here and they say, we've created 1.5 million jobs, I go, oh, that's great. Well, you know what? There's 33,000 people on CDP. Are they any of those 1.5 million? Because if they are, please tell me and I will go trumpet that for you. I will be proud of that for you. But it's not. It's not happening. And then when you talk about the cashless debit card and want to impose it on 23,000 people in the Northern Territory who are already Dang. suffering, already suffering from an intervention that took place under Prime Minister John Howard with the basics card that people are living on in the Northern Territory. That is not giving people hope. And the Close the Gap Day is what I see it should all be about. So that we can look at what our future is. But that future has to be about how we treat one another. And if I see a First Nations bloke in the Cabinet 
of the coalition government being treated like rubbish? What do you think the people out there think? What do you think the people, especially First Nations people, think? You know, we're not silly. There has to be genuine and sincere engagement, and it also means in the treatment of one another in here. Because if that's how you're treating him, it's no wonder people feel out in these organisations, especially these Ab Aboriginal organisations whose funding was cut under Tony Abbott by $500 million and, and they've never recovered since then. And these are areas that deal with health, education and our children who keep getting taken away. I get phone calls from people who desperately need help because their child has been taken away by welfare. Aunties, grandmothers who call, wanting to know what they can do. But first you're dealing with the trauma of the fact that they've realised that child has just been taken from them. As recently as the weekend, a grandmother rings me and says, my grandchild's just been taken from her parents and put on a plane and flown to Darwin from a community. What can I do? This is the daily existence of people out there. Senators, you only have to look at January 26th, just a few weeks ago, to see the hundreds of thousands of Australians who marched in various rallies across the country wanting a better future, a better vision for our country. You know, there might be groups in there that you mightn't agree with, but you've got to step back and be quite impressed by the numbers of people who are just getting out there because they believe in something that we're not doing as a parliament. We're not improving the lives of people, First Nations people, in our jails. There are way too many of them, and that's what a lot of those protests were about. And they'll continue. And too many children being taken away. And tomorrow, on the anniversary of the apology to the stolen generations, we're going to see that again. These groups who are so concerned, as they should be, that there are far greater removals of First Nations kids in this country than there were when Prime Minister Kevin Rudd stood up and apologised on behalf of the stolen generations. That is our collective responsibility as a parliament. So next year, when we come together for Close the Gap, I hope I don't have to keep reminding the parliament of how significant the day is. But I certainly hope we can become a country that's far more understanding of that connection between the policies and the legislation we create in here and the direct impact it has on the lives of First Nations people in this country. Thank you so much, Senator McCarthy. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, when I speak here today, I've, um, I hope that I am going to get across the voice of many Australians. I've never been a pretender and the people of Australia are relying on me to speak openly and honestly about this issue of closing the gap. Closing the gap is complete rubbish, and my thoughts are echoed by many Aboriginals who take the time to meet with me. As far as I'm concerned, it's a joke. The call for recognition is just a feel-good smokescreen that hides the true problems. The biggest problem facing Australian, Aboriginal Australians today is their own lack of commitment and responsibility to helping themselves. Closing the gap is the marketing term used by politicians and bureaucrats so they can feel good about themselves and get in front of TV cameras and pretend they're doing something to lift remote First Nations people out of their self-perpetuating hellholes. Most Australians know that tens of billions of dollars are spent each year to help alter the standard of living between those in remote Aboriginal communities and even those living in our developed parts of Australia. When you spend billions of dollars a year on any group of people, you expect outcomes. But sadly, those billions have gone to the non-productive, unrepentant, 
Aboriginal industry not to where it should go, to the grassroots Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. An industry that has achieved no notable benefit in pulling our First Nations people out of squalor, domestic violence and poverty. When I speak here today, I represent the quiet Australians. Those Australians who have had a gutful of the billion dollar handouts with very little to show for it. Far too many Aboriginal kids in remote communities at this very moment are starving. They're that hungry they are breaking into homes not to steal DVD players but to steal food. Far too many Aboriginal people, Aboriginal kids, are fearful of their alcoholic parents and family members who prey on their vulnerability and those Aboriginal children in my home state of Queensland and towns like Dumaji, Warabinda, Arakoon and Yarrabah remain vulnerable to sexual assault and a life of petrol and paint sniffing under the current weak plans by our federal and state governments. On the other hand, I need to commend the hard work of the NPA Regional Council led by Mayor Eddie Newman and Councillor Michael Bond from New Mapoon, who took the time to meet with me last year to genuinely speak about bringing the gap, bridging the gap. Together with the council colleagues in U Markigo, Magigo, Sasaya, Bamika and Ingenu, they have demonstrated that we can close the gap with work programs and opportunities for our Queensland Indigenous people. So too with the Mayor of the Torres Strait Islander Council, Fred Gila, and the Torres Shire Council Mayor, Vonda Malone. What people need to understand about me and One Nation is that we will always give credit to those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups who are actively striving to better outcomes for their people, but I'll also call out those dysfunctional communities too. I spoke about this issue 24 years ago when I was first elected to the House of Representatives. It wasn't called closing the gap back then, but again, we threw countless billions at the very same problems we're talking about today. What's changed since I first raised those issues? Nothing. We still have Aboriginal kids not going to school. The wonderful air-conditioned school in Dumaji has around 400 students enrolled, but they're barely able to roll call 50 per cent of the students on any given day. They've got just one child in the whole school with a 100 per cent attendance record. Whose fault's that? Lazy parents. You can't blame the whites when it's your own negligence. We can throw all the money in the world at building these schools with three meals a day for two dollars to make sure Aboriginal kids are given a wholesome meal while they're at school, but if they don't turn up, how do they get ahead in life? We're also bribing parents with payments to send their kids to school, but that's not even working. Never before have Aboriginal people been given greater opportunity to get a job. I see it frequently where it's advertised, only Aboriginals need apply. I had a letter sent to my office last year that confessed to applying for one of these jobs, even though he wasn't he knew he wasn't Aboriginal and, in fact, he wasn't even Australian. He was a Pacific Islander. When he was quizzed about his heritage, he made up a story saying he was a part of the stolen generation and had no, pro no proper knowledge of his background. What type of mockery does this create? As far as many Australians feel, we have widened the gap as a result of federal and high court decisions. Only yesterday, we undermined our border security and immigration laws with a decision by our High Court. We widen the gap by dropping Australia's national anthem at football games, but are expected to stand and conduct a welcome to country. You will never close the gap while this parliament continues to hand native title land claims back to land councils. <laughs> 
The tensions this creates among tribes or mobs is feeding the division in many of these remote communities. I hear frequently from Aboriginals who have serious concerns with the behaviour of Noel Pearson and Jason Yenner, alias Little Boy Murundu Yenner. These people aren't helping to close the gap, they're simply riding the gravy train. Incarceration rates of Aboriginals remain alarmingly high, even with the reluctance from the courts to jail them. The simple truth is, if you do the crime, you do the time. We expect it of every other Australian or person who comes to this country. If you want to close the gap, start taking some responsibility for your own people. As the old saying goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. We've provided the schools. It's now up to you to send your own kids to school. We've provided the jobs, but it's up to you to turn up when you're rostered on, not when it suits. It's up to the Aboriginals to stay off the grog and the drugs. I will leave you with my final thoughts. Closing the gap should be about treating all Australians equally and on an individual needs basis, not one based on race. These government policies that are based on race are, them, are themselves discriminatory and racist. Stop feeding the resentment in this country and you'll naturally close the gap. And stop playing the victim if we are to move forward as a united country. Resentment, hatred and blaming has to stop. We owe this to all future generations regardless of race or colour. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I, I've always taken the view... Sorry? Is there a problem? My, understa my understanding was that Senator Bragg... Senator Waters. Oh my God. Understanding was the convention was that leaders of parties um, had precedence over newly arrived senators, and I acknowledge that in the most recent circumstance, Senator McCarthy was given the call on the basis that she is a proud First Nations woman, and I support that call. But I don't believe that Senator Bragg has that same claim, and so I'm seeking the call. Senator. You have discretion, Chair. And I'm sorry, he's got the call. He didn't the Chair has discretion yeah, anyway. It's not your call. Senator Waters, you have the call in this instance. Thank you, thank you very much, Deputy President. And I rise as the Greens leader in the Senate to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're on, the Ngunnawal people, and acknowledge that as sovereignty was never ceded, we're on stolen land. And this was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I would like to pay tribute to the First Nations parliamentarians uh, in this place. In relation to the last contribution that we just heard from One Nation leader Pauline Hanson. It's the racism that we've come to expect from her and her party. Um, and I might note this is precisely why the Greens are pushing for a parliamentary code of conduct that would ban hate speech. So I'd like to apologise on her behalf for the offence that was likely caused to many listeners to those words. They don't reflect the sentiment of this chamber, nor do I believe they reflect the sentiment of the vast majority of Australians. Um, we heard some very fine words from the Prime Minister this morning, but words 
will not close the gap. Action will. And so far, this government is known for the racist Northern Territory intervention, the racist cashless debit card, cutting half a million dollars from the Indigenous Advancement Strategy and cutting funding for the Family Violence Prevention Legal Service. And just this week, in court, arguing that uh, Indigenous people with dual, citizens, uh, dual citizenship should be deported as aliens. So the Prime Minister's remarks this morning were frankly hypocritical compared to the actions of this government. And in fact, he went so far as to imply that the Close the Gap targets were too ambitious. No, no, they are not. And we need truth, treaty, and justice. Now, I, I support and endorse the comments made by our wonderful spokesperson for Indigenous Affairs, Senator Rachel Seward, and pay tribute to the many years that she's worked on these issues. I want to make just a few remarks about the issues facing um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women um, and on some uh, resourcing matters. Now, First Nations women experience violence at three times the rate of non-Indigenous women. First Nations women are 32 times as likely to be hospitalised due to family violence as non-Indigenous women. The government's fourth action plan for the elimination of violence against women did start to make some positive noises. It noted the need to respect and listen to First Nations people affected by violence and acknowledge their unique experiences. Um, it noted the need to deliver high-quality, holistic, trauma-informed and culturally safe uh, supports suited to the complex needs of First Nations women and children. And it noted the need to address the immediate impacts and the underlying drivers of family violence in First Nations communities through collective action. But despite those commitments, the government cut funding to the National Family Violence Prevention and Legal Services Forum, FVPLS as it's known. The forum is the coordinating body for First Nations organisations that are dedicated to addressing family and domestic violence, and it plays a critical role in implementing culturally safe family violence prevention services. Um, it works to give a collective voice to First Nations women and children affected by family violence, and it helps to shape effective, targeted and culturally appropriate government policy responses. Now, there was a national evaluation of the FVPLS program, and it recommended increased funding to support members, to develop resources, to share information about best practices. Those are exactly the things that the FVPLS National Forum is providing, and yet the government cut its funding. The cuts are entirely inconsistent with this so-called close the gap refresh and the principles of co-design. The cuts will put culturally appropriate family violence services at risk, and by doing so, they put First Nations women and children at risk. The Greens have called on the government not only to reverse those funding cuts to the National FVPLS Forum, but to increase funding to this critical service. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner June Oscar Ao said this in response to the cuts. The National FVPLS Forum supports our women and helps to keep us and our families safe. It is also a member of the Close the Gap campaign, and we must ask how we can close health and wellbeing gaps when the organisations tasked with doing so are themselves under threat of closure. Uh, now, On maternal health care, the Closing the Gap report recognises that maternal health, including anti- and prenatal care, is the key driver in improving Indigenous child mortality. Complications in pregnancy and birth result in a widening gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous child mortality, and this is inexcusable. History and politics continue to shape the lives of the health of First Nations peoples, overall affecting the health of First Nations women and their babies. I want to note the tragic death of Naomi Williams, a 27-year-old Wiradjuri woman who was 22 weeks pregnant when she died of septicemia in January 2016. Ms Williams had made 20 visits to various medical centres in the months leading up to her death, but had been turned away or given little medical attention. Last year, a New South Wales coronial inquest into her death identified clear and ongoing deficiencies in the care Ms Williams received. The coroner found that implicit bias, lack of culturally appropriate providers, 
and a lack of Indigenous representation in health services and boards can no longer be denied. The government must do more to urgently improve access to culturally appropriate care, particularly in maternal health. Now, lastly, I want to address um, the fact that this government continues to ignore First Nations people on resource decisions. Fracking for shale gas has started in the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory against the wishes of traditional owners who are terrified about the impacts on their water resources. This government has ignored them. And in fact, our environmental laws don't even cover that fracking because it's for shale gas. The federal government did, however, approve the pipeline for the export of that gas. This government also has repeatedly voted against my draft legislation, my bill, to give landholders, including traditional owners, the right to say no to fracking, to coal and to gas. Sadly, there's more examples. The Wangan and Jagalingu people in my home state of Queensland have unequivocally opposed the Adani coal mine. They did not consent to the mine and they have fought it in court. They continue to fight it. Uh, even when Adani have callously pursued Wangan and Jagalingu council leader Adrian Baragaba for costs. This government has not only ignored them, but it's approved the mine. But it also stood by as the Queensland government extinguished native title over the Wangan and Jugalingu country to enable the mine to proceed. This government has allowed traditional owners to be treated as trespassers, and just this week it took the High Court to rule that Indigenous people who were dual citizens were not aliens in their own country. There's a credibility gap between this government's words and their actions, and we need not just a refresh of the closing the gap. Uh, approach. We need a refresh of the people running this joint. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, I mean, the overriding sense from this day uh, has always been for me a sense that this country has let Indigenous people down. And the reason uh, that I wanted to spend a large part of my first speech uh, last year dealing with this issue is I've always felt it was. Uh, the nation's unfinished business. I mean, how could we have a situation where um, people uh, can be left so far behind on almost every um, social indicator? And frankly, uh, to hear some of the, the contributions that were made earlier, uh, I'm really not sure what world they're living in. Um, but um, I have promised myself I'd make these brief remarks free of politics. I, uh, it mean, uh, the. I think today is a good day in the sense that um, we now have a, a lot more Indigenous input into uh, what these targets should look like, and I very much uh, welcome that. And I think next year, I'm hoping that we will see some significant improvements. This year, of course, uh, um, improvements on early childhood and also Year 12 attainment steps in the right direction, but a lot more to do. Um, just in the few minutes I have. Um, uh, the reason that I'm a big believer in having a, a voice, an Indigenous voice, is uh, when I travel around New South Wales and um, I talk to Indigenous people, they often always make the same point to me, that on the ground, whether they're community leaders or whether they're community members, that they haven't got sufficient control uh, to run their affairs uh, at the grassroots level in the way that they would like to do so. Uh, so my sense is that if a, if a voice uh, could create more control for Indigenous people on the ground, that it was practical, uh, that would be a very, very good step forward. More broadly, there is an important uh, work, uh, an important job for us to do on recognising Indigenous people in the constitution. And I am very confident that uh, Minister White, who is the first Indigenous person to hold uh, a cabinet rank and also to hold that portfolio, uh, will shepherd through a good process which will give the community uh, many options for what a voice could look like. Now that process is being chaired by uh, Marsha Langton and Tom uh, Calver, and that is a, a good process. Uh, once that voice is nailed down, uh, there will be an opportunity to talk about uh, constitutional recognition. Now I think that the, the benefit of doing the voice f first is that the voice uh, is, is substantive, is material, and it could actually uh, be um, the sort of reform that could really change some of those uh, numbers we've seen today, which I think everyone would agree uh, we do need to do more work on. So certainly from my point of view, uh, 
I very much look forward to working in a bipartisan fashion uh, as we uh, develop uh, these, these models for voices. The Labor Party in the, uh, in the committees that I've been in have been very constructive and I have to say that um, despite some of the reporting today, I'm optimistic about what this uh, process uh, could actually achieve. Uh, Senator um, um, McAllister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, Senator Hanson has dedicated her public life to lowering the tone of every debate that she participates in, and today is no exception. If she was unable to show empathy or understanding, she could have at least shown restraint. Her racist comments, and they are racist, have no place in this chamber. Now, First Nations people have endured far worse over the years. Now, I have faith in their strength and their resilience. Senator Hanson, after all, is not such a formidable opponent. But it doesn't make her comments OK. They are not OK. We have heard from many speakers today about the challenges that face First Nations communities. The challenge that we ought to take up in this place, in this parliament, as true allies to First Nations communities who are fighting for their future and the future of their children. Those challenges are many. And while we've made some progress, as the reports today demonstrate, the results on health, on education, on early childhood are simply unacceptable. As the Leader of the Opposition said earlier today, these are not just statistics. These are people—sons, daughters, brothers and sisters, aunties and uncles. If we want to see real progress on closing the gap, we must properly understand how the consequences of dispossession, the removal from country and culture, the misguided policies, no matter how well-intentioned, have transcended generations and can still be seen and felt today. Well, First Nations people have given us a map. They gathered in Uluru and they made the statement, the statement from the heart. And they talked about what they wanted, clearly, unequivocally, and with a unity of purpose that we do well to heed. Because what First Nations people have asked for is a voice to parliament. And if we mean what we say when we say that we wish to partner with people, then what could be more sensible than a voice established to allow First Nations people to be consulted on the questions that affect them. If the analysis provided by the government today about the results from closing the gap is correct, if we accept it, that the results derive from a failure to work with one First Nations people, then how can we reject their call for a voice? How can we reject their call for a constitutionally enshrined voice and the certainty that such enshrinement would offer to those people. The statement from the heart also asks for Makarata, for treaty making, for truth telling. These are opportunities for Australia, opportunities for us to embrace our history, to embrace what First Nations people offer us. Today, is an opportunity to reflect on how far we have to go in closing the gap in quality of life for Indigenous Australians. Our contributions should be thoughtful. They should be measured. They should have the integrity of the contributions we have heard earlier from our First Nations senators, my comrades Senator McCarthy and Senator Dodson. And I am so proud of the contributions they made in this place today. They stand in stark contrast to what was offered by Senator Hanson. Today, 
is not a day for bigotry and it is not a day for filth. Senator Lyons. Well, in the two minutes that uh, I have at this point, um, I too concur with the sentiments expressed by Senator McAllister. I was appalled to hear the contributions from Senator Hanson today, but that is all I'll say on that matter because I'm not going to give them any further air. I also think it's time that we heard the First Nations voice at Closing the Gap. Today in the House we should have heard the voices of Mr Ken White and Mr Linda Burney. Tonight in this place, in the Senate, the first voices we should have heard were of um, Senator Dodson and Senator McCarthy. Um, that's how it should be, and I hope that next year we can get better agreement. The fact that Senator McCarthy had to line up behind non-Indigenous speakers offended me greatly. I told her I was going to mention this, and I'm glad that I've put it on the record. Because if we are honest and sincere about listening, about a partnership, about First Nations people leading, then we haven't done it in this place and we didn't do it in the House today. I'm deeply offended that uh, my granddaughter, a young Gidja from Turkey Creek in Western Australia— Thank had... you, Senator Lyons. You'll be Thank in you. continuance, and I propose the Senate adjourn. Senator Chandler.